Guys, would you grab hold of a Bible and make your way to Matthew chapter 6. Wherever you find yourself this morning, in your living room, in your bedroom, in your car, whatever that looks like, I hope you have a Bible nearby and that you would join us this morning for a special message this morning in Matthew chapter 6. If you need to do so electronically in a phone or an iPad or whatever that looks like, we just want to invite you here. This morning we want to have a special message just looking here and considering what Jesus has to say here that applies obviously very uh, directly into our world. We do that for a number of reasons. On Sunday mornings we're making our way through Timothy and uh, just having a sense that both in this disconnected time that this would be a message that God would speak and definitely sensed him leading me there. But also the next section that we have in Timothy It's kind of a connected section. It would do good to do them back to back. And so next week will be Palm Sunday and then Easter. And the week after that, we'll get back into our study in Timothy. But for today, we want to be here. So again, I hope you have a Bible. I hope you've made your way there to Matthew chapter 6. Let's take a moment and ask for God's help. Let's just ask that God would speak to us this morning through his word. Would you join me? God, I thank you for your word that nothing can hinder. You said that your word is powerful, that when it goes forth from your mouth, it doesn't return to you void without accomplishing the purposes for which you sent it. And there's a wonderful sense that nothing right now hinders us from the power of your word. God, I pray that this morning it would be so much true that today we would hear from you that you would speak to us, that you would speak to us in this kind of different technological setting, but by the power of your Spirit, through the authority and force of your Word, that our lives would be affected by you. God, help. God, you can do that in ways I could never. You could take this and apply it to each person right where they are and write what they need. Would you do that, please? Would you give us each ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us today? Pray for that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I find myself thinking, in this season that we find ourselves in, dealing with the coronavirus and all that's happening in our world, if you could put a meter to measure the the state of worry, I wonder what that would look like. I mean, I wonder what it would look like nationally. I wonder what it would look like in your life. I mean, if it was all together kind of just really doing well, kind of cool as a cucumber, everything's fine, or if it kind of begins to move to a little bit more to just a little bit more anxious than normal, or for some, all the way to just maxing out the meter. I mean, freaking out in many ways. Well, I want you to know, and you probably know, I think if we could monitor what's happening in our world right now, that's exactly what we'd see. We'd see that the, the, it has gone way up, that the, the number of those who are worried and the number of those who, who find themselves anxious has, has moved way up. And I think even in your life, it would be so. You know, it's exactly into that season that we come into a section where Jesus is going to speak directly to worry where he's going to call us to that. But before we go there, I want to just pause and say, I think this is an appropriate message right now. Certainly what I sense God talking to me about and what I feel like he has me to share this morning. But it's not limited to this season. It's not like this is the only season people have ever worried. No, worry has always been a problem. Two weeks ago, a month ago, six months ago, so many dealing with it and worry becomes such a destructive thing. Worry becomes a thing that that moves people and and in so many ways can create spaces in in life that's altogether unhelpful, and so Jesus is speaking to this. Now, we all need that. We all need to hear this, but I'm just talking to you specifically because I know that as I say this, for some of you, worry is a big deal. I mean, if worry was a team sport, you would be our most valuable player. 
You know, you're the kind of person who's like, no, I, I, I worry a lot, and I worry well. I mean, I, or whatever that would look like. There would be a space that for some of you, and I'm not speaking it to, to mock or belittle. I'm just saying that I want you to hear this, but I want you to hear it with a, with a way of bringing both hope and help. I think about a passage that's given to us in the Psalms, or in Psalm 94, it says, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. I, I just love this, and I want to just speak that to you, because there isn't a sense that I want to mock or make fun or make you feel bad. I want to tell you, there is a place where worry becomes, and, and it is a space in our life. And God says that's exactly where His words, where, where His comforts can bring delight. And I just know that for some of us, that's exactly what we need. That we're in a season where worry might be gripping our lives in a way that it hadn't before, or it's definitely up. I don't want to mock that. I want to just tell you, I think there's a space where this would become into a place that would speak hope, because it's exactly in this space where Jesus is going to speak to us, and he's going to tell us not to worry. Why don't you just notice with me the first verse that's there. There in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says it this way. He says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry. Hey, pause there. That's why we're here. I mean, Jesus is speaking this to us uh, without a whole lot of background. It's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount uh, where Jesus is making some incredible proclamations, both about who he is and his kingdom. He's just dealt with the place of money in our lives and that that wouldn't be a God in our lives. And, and that rolls into this space. There's definitely a rolling to it. So it begins with a therefore, but we're not going to even try to build all of that. I think it's enough for us just to step into this moment and tell us that Jesus is speaking to us, that he's going to tell us this morning and he's going to speak into our lives this place where he's calling us to be a people that don't worry. And he's going to reason with us. He's going to give us helps in that. But I want to give you what maybe is the most significant help I could say this morning. And that is this because Jesus, because Jesus says so. That, that right now where he's speaking this here and where he's telling us not to worry, I just want you to understand this is what Jesus wants for you. I mean, if he's speaking this, if he's telling us not to worry, there's not anybody here that he's not speaking to. If he's speaking it to us, then it's possible. But it's not just possible because he said so. It's possible because he then becomes the source of strength to do that. Now, this is one of the most amazing things. And again, for, for somebody, this is going to be the thing that you just need to hear more than anything else. All of God's commands in our lives become the place where he would be our strength. There's not anything he's asking you to do that he would not empower you to do. And that becomes hopeful. In fact, we could go so far as to say, you know, Jesus is the one that told us that without him, we could do nothing. Yeah, there in, in John 15, he says, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Paul would kind of tie into that, and he'd say it this way in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we have this, I can't do anything without him, but with him all things. And I want that just to speak to your life this morning. I want you to think about it this way, that we should let God do the impossible in our life, that our God is the one who can and does do that. That there is a space of just recognizing that what is impossible for men is possible for God. And for the one that I'm speaking to right now, you just need to hear it because I know I think I'm talking to somebody who really does struggle with worry. But in so many ways, you've just felt it was a losing battle. That there was no way for this ever to change. That there was no way that you could ever find just a rescue from that. But I'm telling you that if Jesus is asking it, then Jesus can make it happen. That it's his power that can make that come to pass. That he's the one that would supply that, and I love that that would be true. In fact, think about it this way a little bit more with me. We're going to work through this section, and Jesus is going to just chop away at things that cause us to worry. He's going to give us at least seven 
different things that will speak into rescuing us from worry. And it might be that one of these things is just for you. And, and so I hope that you would hear each of them, and maybe all of them together, or maybe one of them specifically would be yours. But the thing behind all of them is I want you to think about what Jesus is offering us. See, out of these seven, there are a couple of them that are pretty much a universal truth. What I mean by that is that there are people in the world who can and do say the same things. It might even be that for some of you, you'll be like, well, you know, I, I heard somebody. We had a motivational speaker come to our workplace or where they sent us and they mentioned some of these same things or they mentioned a few of these things because there are principles that Jesus is going to give a couple of them that are not unique to Christianity. Now, many of them are. Much of them are only going to be true because of Christianity. But even in the ones that are universally true, the world at times can point out truth, but it can't give us power. And Jesus, he both tells us what he has, but he also works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. And I think how good that is for us to recognize, to come in and to say, okay, well, I want to hear these things, but just take joy in whatever he would speak into our lives, that he would give us the ability to do that. So let's begin working through these things that Jesus chops away at this place of worry in our lives. Again, just verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Jesus just speaks to us and says, you know, part of the thing is to recognize is that life is so much more. The place of worry, when worry becomes a, a place that just begins to consume parts of our heart and our world, one of the things it simply does is it reduces our life down to those worries. It, it quenches, it, it just squashes everything else that's there. And we become those who begin to just only focus on surviving only focus on making it through that moment. But Jesus just says, life is so much more than that. That's not living. That's surviving. That's not, that's not what life is meant to be. There's something so much more in that. And there's a place of just saying it. It's so much more than the things that we would worry about, very specifically being things like food or clothing and, and specifically being those realities. Now, here's kind of a crazy moment. For most of us as Americans, we could have read this a month ago, and it's not that food is not a problem. It's always been one of those things that people think about, but for some of you in this space, it's become the first time in your life that it's ever become weird to you, that you go to the grocery store and it's like, there's no, there's the shelves, they're like, they're empty, or everything I wanted to go for, and, and actually you kind of find yourself just in a weird space that you might never have been in before. Well, much of our world goes through that all the time. And even before that, we faced it. But here's the deal. When worry begins to grip into that, it reduces life. It, it causes it. So we're just surviving. And Jesus just tells us that's not living. Worry does something to you that moves you from really living life. And you don't want that to be a part of that. So he speaks that to us. And then he adds to it. He calls us to there in, in verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? This is one of those great, just applicational, almost amazing moments. Jesus just tells us, hey, go out and look at the birds. Go out and look at God's creation and, and watch the birds for a little while. You know, that might actually be a good suggestion. And just watch them. And, 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 and there's not a fretting, there's not a worrying, there's not a, a, a panicking with it within them. There's a sense that there's a, a place of just living. And, and there's something there as he causes us to see that, is he wants us to think through who we are. And I'm speaking very specifically to you who are followers of Christ that you're Christians, and there's a sense of what he causes us to understand is that we have God as our Father. He specifically speaks that. I mean, you saw it, but see it again. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, 
For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Heavenly Father. And as Jesus just speaks this and watches, you, know, you watch how birds live and not fretting and just being able to live on the things that are provided, Jesus applies it this way, the end of verse 26. Are you not of more value than they? That there would be a sense that what Jesus is saying is that we need to recognize the value that God places on you. That he looks at you and he values you more than the birds of the air. He sees you and knows you, and this is really powerful. One of the things that really causes worry in our life is the place where we begin to feel forgotten, where we begin to feel looked over, unrecognized, a place where we begin to think, well, then who's going to take it? I mean, how is this all going to work out? And, and almost feel panicked in the sense that there's not that. And yet what Jesus is telling us is that part of what would work against worry is to recognize the, the love that God has for us, the value he places on us. Paul would say it this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? Uh, this is a powerful reason. He says, okay, if God so loved you, so loved the world that he gave us his son, the greatest possible gift, the greatest sacrifice to accomplish the greatest good, would he not care about everything else? Uh, is, is there no, there's just no sense that you're forgotten by him. There's no sense that he, that he doesn't see you. And all by itself, just to begin to recognize that, to recognize the value that God would place on that, his love for you would begin to just rescue us in some of the things that bring worry. That we would say, okay, I, I, that's, that's, I, I have a reason not to give up or worry because I have a God who loves me. I have a God who cares about me. Jesus then applies that a little bit more. He says in verse 27, which of you? by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature. And this is one of those funny things, if you can just allow yourself to get there, there's a sense of just letting us know that worry, it doesn't actually accomplish anything. It's not actually an effective thing, it's actually a destructive thing. That there's a sense that a worry, it can't add a cubit to your stature, or the idea that if, if you feel short, it can't make you taller. That's just, that's just a simple truth. Some translations look at this and, and feel like, well, maybe it's not a, a, a matter of height. Maybe it's a, a, a length of life thing. And so we could say that true. Worry cannot make your life any longer. As a matter of fact, it might make it shorter uh, because it just the, the, the pain and stress that would be there. But there is a sense of just recognizing to sit there and fret and panic. It doesn't actually change things. It doesn't actually change those things. It actually, it, it can't, you, you could worry about how long you'll live, or you could worry about how tall you are. It doesn't actually do anything. Jesus, when he was speaking about this in another place, using much of the same truths as he spoke it again on another occasion, in Luke chapter 8, he would say it this way. He said, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If then you are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? If your worry can't fix that, then why would you spend so much time doing that? Why would you uh, allow that to happen? And this is just one of those things. This is one of those principles that even people in our world will talk about. Just how ineffective it is. Just that worry becomes something that to be there, to be in that place, to be in that space of, of just being anxious, it doesn't actually accomplish anything. Now, we ought to quickly pause and try to make a quick demarcation that really is important in the midst of this, that we're not talking about wisdom, we are talking about worry. There is a place where we think about the future, or we're thinking about things, and we do have something to do, and it does cause us to, 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 to act. You have some designer who's, you know, building something, and he, and, he, and he sits there, and he thinks about it, and, all, and ideas come to his mind that begin to move into that design. 
You have a doctor who's caring for a patient and is thinking about that patient. And when they think about it, they, they get a, a, oh yeah, we should try that or we should look into that. You have a pastor who's preparing a message and, and then himself thinking about it and thinking, okay, how do I say that well and how could that happen? Those are moments that isn't worry. That's when you're thinking, okay, what, can I, what, what do I need to do now? And there is a place of, of wisdom where we think about things, where we think about future, where we think about things that are happening that isn't anxiety. It's just trying to do it well. But worry becomes that place where you're not actually doing anything, you're just fretting. Well, what if this happens? <laughs> what if that happens? And, and what if this happens, then that happens? And, and some of you know how this works, because worry becomes almost like a floodgate. You begin to let a couple worries go, well, what if this happens? <gasps> and if that happens, then this is going to happen. And if that happens, then this is going to happen. And, and then pretty soon the whole world's been destroyed by the worry that you started. And it, it just, it's completely ineffective. That's what Jesus is speaking about. That place of just fretting and worrying about things that are outside your control, that you have no ability to make. It's, not, you're, it's totally ineffective for you to spend time on. And so again, he's just telling us, hey, you can't do that. You, you can't change anything by your worry. So it's a waste of your time. He draws us back to consider this idea of just how God cares for us. And so as he reasons it this way, he begins there in verse 28 and says, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. He invites us to consider God's faithfulness and this place where he's asking us to trust him. He'd already asked us to think about the birds, to go out and just look at the birds, and that's a good lesson. Now he adds to it and says, just go out and look at flowers. Go out and look at what, how beautiful they are. And, and realize God is the one that's provided that. He's the one that has given them their beauty. There's a verse in, in Ecclesiastes that says that God makes everything beautiful in its time. And there's a sense of just recognizing his ability to, to work in that and see the, the, the way that that works, to, to see what, what is there. And once more, he's speaking about worry just to make sure that I don't get lost in this or you go outside of this, there's no sense that he's calling us to being lazy. There's no sense that he's telling us that we shouldn't, you know, endeavor to do whatever we, we need to do to take care of ourselves, to, to get a job, to, to provide for our families, to, to think of food and clothing in that sense. There's no sense that he's asking us just to sit on our couch and just open up our mouth and have everything given to us. No, but there is a sense where what he's telling us is that when we think about all of our needs, whatever those are, food or clothing or money or jobs or health, whatever those are, there's a place where we're called to trust him. Now, that trust would always lead us to pray. That if we're in Christ, it's not that we neglect those ideas. It's not a sense that we say, well, you know, I'm just assuming all that's going to happen. No, actually in Philippians, I like the way it says it. In Philippians chapter 4, it says, Be anxious for nothing, or again, be worried about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So speaking into the same thing, Jesus is telling us, hey, I don't want you to worry. Here in Philippians, God is telling us, I don't want you to be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But it doesn't have the idea that we're not thinking about those things ever. He says, whatever you're worried about, tell God about it. Whatever, whatever that is, whatever has you concerned, tell God about that. But once you've done that, there is a sense of walking in wisdom and doing whatever is in your power. But once you've done that, there becomes a place where what he's inviting us to do is to trust him, to, to, to have a place where we recognize that, you know, we can trust our lives into the hands of God, 
that we can say, okay, God, you're good, that you're a God who's, who's worthy of this, that you're a God who's worthy of our, of our, of our trust. Then we move into that place where we, we trust him in a place where the Bible talks about us enjoying contentment. Now, that contentment isn't based on what we have. That contentment is based on God. In fact, I I like the way it says it in Hebrews. In Hebrews 13, he would say it to us this way. He says, let your conduct or the way that you live your life be without covetousness. Don't be in a place where you're desiring what you don't have. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So think this through for a moment. True contentment doesn't have anything to do with what you have, but who has you. That there's a sense that what he's telling us is that we should trust him. A a, a place that we should recognize God has not abandoned us. He's not left us alone. He's with us. And so to to find ourselves worried about that begins to negate that and, and miss what it is. And so when Jesus speaks it here, He just says again in verse 30, Now if God so clothes the grasses of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And then Jesus just speaks it in a gentle rebuke. Oh, you have little faith. Why don't you trust him? I mean, why don't you believe in him? Why don't you believe in the God who's good? And, And just that place where he would call us to say, I can do that. Now, that's, that's a powerful reality. You know, it's a scary world that we are living in, and it's always been that way. But there's a, a place where God is trustworthy, and He's here. And, and for us to be able to say, I, I can trust an unknown future into the hands of a known God, that I can say, God, it, it, my, my, my hope, my ability to not worry isn't because I know how everything's going to work out, but I know you, and I know you're here, and I know you would never leave us. I know you'd never forsake us, and so there's a sense that Jesus just calls us to have faith, that we would recognize, and faith, it's trusting in what we can't see. It is that place of believing and trusting in a God who is good and worthy, and and we can have that place of confidence. I long for that for you. How long that that would be there for you in your life even now? Okay, so let's just think about it. So Jesus is speaking to us. He's telling us he doesn't want you and he doesn't want me to worry. He's given us a few things. He says, you know, we're to do this because life is more than worry. Because God values us. Because worrying itself is ineffective. And that God is faithful. And then he just adds to it. And just draws us back into that concept that he's already been building, this understanding of who God is as our Father. So he says it this way in verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Your heavenly Father knows. Jesus looks at this and he lets us know that there's something about worry that is altogether ungodly. A place where he looks out at those that don't know him, that don't have him, and he says, you know, that's what the Gentiles do. That's that's those that don't have this relationship with God. That's how they live their lives. And in one sense, almost rightly live their lives. Because they don't have something to to find their confidence in. But he simply tells it to us this way. He says, but your heavenly Father knows. If God is your Father, then that should change the way you do this. You know, I should pause and just ask you that. Is God your Father? Is He one that you have that relationship with where He is your heavenly Father? That's actually only true if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. That's only true if you're a Christian and have embraced God in Christ. God would speak it to us this way there in the book of John. He would tell us, but as many as received him, that is received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, 
to those who believe in his name. To them, he says, who believe in Jesus, who embrace Jesus, to them he gives the right, the privilege, the the place where we get to become the children of God. As much as I can, I just want to be very clear there. We live in a world that will often communicate that everybody's a child of God, like we're all children of God. That's not a biblical truth. We're all God's creation. But only those who believe in Jesus have been brought into the family of God. Only those who have a relationship with Jesus now get to call God our Heavenly Father with a genuine and actual reality. If you're watching right now and that's not you, then maybe this is your moment. I mean, that would, could be one of the amazing things that comes out of a scary season like we're in is to draw you to recognize that you have so much to be worried about because you don't have a source to go to, that you need Jesus, that God so loved the world that he did send his son so that we could become children of God, so that we could be rescued from our sin, so that we could be rescued from the destruction that's there, that God would draw, draw us into everything that's that. And if that's you, we're just even praying for you right now that you would surrender your life to Christ. If you need someone to talk to, we'd love to talk to you about that. Reach out to us. Talk to others. But today would be a great day for you to surrender. So there is a sense that only Christians can say that. But if you are a Christian, then he's calling us to recognize this. That we should live our lives as if we actually do have a Heavenly Father who loves us and cares about us. We should live our lives in such a way that the way that we handle our life recognizes that we have a God who actually cares about us. I mean, Jesus just speaks it. He says there in verse 32, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He, he knows you. He knows us. He made us. There's not anything up there where he's like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. No, he knows you, and he loves you, and he cares about you. And if there would be a sense of just believing that, then we could trust him. I could say, okay, God, I I, I know that you know me. I know that you know what's happening. I know that you get our world. I know that you see our our life. And I can have a confidence, not because I I, I see how it's all happening or where this is all going to go, but I know I have a father who loves me, who will never leave me. And who cares about all of my cares is not going to let those things be lost. There's a trust in that. That we would recognize that he's good to us in that. There's so much more we could say there. There's so much more that's in that. But I simply want to put that before you. And simply tell you that there's something wonderful about recognizing that he's our father. That he's the one that loves us and cares about us. From that, there in verse 33, Jesus says it this way. But, instead of worrying and and living that life of worry, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first that we are to be those. One of the reasons why worry is not to consume our life is because we are made to be a people that are seeking God first. That's God's design for us. That's the way he, what he is. And he's, he's simply telling us, hey, that should be your focus. You know, right before this, Jesus had, had said that, you know, not to, that worry kind of limits your life, that it makes it less than anything else that's there. But here he's telling us, here's what real life is. It's found in loving God and seeking him first, that we would become those who say, that we recognize that we want to be about what he is and, and what he's doing. I think about just the idea that Jesus told us that the main thing that you and I are created for is to know him, to love him. The great commandment given to us is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's where our life is to be found. To find ourselves only existing and only worried about food or clothing or our jobs or our homes or our economy, we'd miss it. Those are such transitory and temporary things. We've been drawn into a relationship with God. And the best thing, the greatest thing that we should be about is pursuing Him 
and, and, and what he's doing, those things which are going to last forever, where we'd long for his kingdom. We'd long that, that he would be bringing into our life his righteousness and working into our life everything that's good. There would be a space here, he says, that that would be where we are. And out of that, he simply says, and God would take care of all your needs. Your heavenly father would do that, that he says, you know, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Uh, the things that, that you're worried about, he'll care for those. Sometimes I like to think about this as an exchange. That God would look at you and he'd look at me and he says, you know, your, your mental capacity is only so big. <laughs> your ability to focus is only so much. Tell you what, you think about these things. You seek my kingdom. You seek my, and I'll care for all the other stuff. You, you give me your worries and I'll free you to be focused on my kingdom. Uh, I'll free you in a place where that should be your focus. Now, there's a challenge in this. There's a call that Christ is saying that that's where you and I are supposed to be going and that's where we're supposed to be pursuing. But I also want to just say there's a graciousness in it as well. When Jesus would share some of the same thoughts that are recorded in Luke, he would add another thought. He said, you know, seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Do not fear, <laughs> little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That Jesus would say, not only is he telling us to make that our focus, but God's actually doing it. He's actually building his kingdom. That he's doing a work that's going to just transcend time. That's going to go into heaven. That's going to be a glorious kingdom that's coming. That he's faithfully doing that and he's giving us that. And those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that we should make our focus of and to. You know, I think about this reality, this place where he's telling us we should do this, that, that we should make God's kingdom our focus, that we should make that what we're pursuing. And I want to just pause and just ask you, so does that look like your life right now? Now, this has always been true. It is always meant to be true that our life is to have a first priority, a first priority which is seeking God. And that's not the idea that we do that first and then move on to other things. The idea is that that becomes the highest principle of everything that we do. See, you could love your family and at the same moment be putting God first in that. You could do your job. And at the same moment, be seeking God first and longing to be a part of his kingdom 24-7. And he's inviting us to do that, and it's always meant to be there. So all of us need that. But there's just some unique moments right now. Now, for some of you, let's just be clear. And I, I want to speak both honor and encouragement. I know that for some of you, you're dealing with this coronavirus and you're dealing with the ramifications that are flowing into our world. Uh, your life is incredibly complicated. We have some of our folks that are in the medical field and you, you, you don't have any more time on your hands today than you had a month ago. In fact, you have less. Uh, you're working hard and, and you're busy and we just want to speak honor to that and we want to tell you that we are praying for you and we appreciate you. I, I know for me, even though I am kind of speaking to pretty much an, an empty sanctuary this morning, my life is still found in preparing, pre preparing my every day, every week for Sunday and Wednesday. So I don't look at like I have a whole bunch of time that I didn't have. Honestly, I probably have less. But for some of you, you have some time on your hands. I mean, some crazy time. You, you, you have time at home that you just, in fact, you're bored. I mean, you found yourself like, okay, should I organize my sock drawer? I don't even know. I mean, what do I do with my time? I mean, and I, you know, people posted crazy things on social media, and I get some of that, but I just want to ask you, what might you be doing with this time? Uh, if, you see, if you put God first and made that the focus, I was talking to, to Miss Gay this week, and we were just thinking about it, and she, she was reminding me of John Bunyan. And if you don't know, he's the man that wrote Pilgrim's Progress. It is the second most popular book in history. The first is the Bible. The number of copies bought of any book in history ever, the Bible's the first. The second most popular book in history 
is Pilgrim's Progress, which is an incredible allegory of the Christian life. So worth reading if you haven't done so. But here's the interesting thing. John Bunyan was arrested and uh, for his faith because he wasn't you know, working under the established church and he was preaching the gospel in a place where it really wasn't being allowed. And so he was put in prison and absolutely isolated. He was locked away from, from other people and, and couldn't be there. And you know what he did with that time? He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, he redeemed that moment. And, he, and he's like, okay, you know what? And, and thoughts that had been in his head, he just began putting pen to paper. And we are the beneficiaries today of his isolation. Paul the Apostle, incredible man, used greatly by God. And several times he was isolated. He was locked in prison. You know what he did with those? He wrote much of the New Testament. He wrote letters that today are are blessings into our lives. And I I find myself just thinking about that, wondering, for some of you, you have space in your life that you have not had almost ever. And what are you doing with it? I mean, if all you're doing is, you know, catching up on your Netflix and and watching shows and beating video games, and I just want to tell you, not that there's not a place for relaxing, because there is. But God, I mean, to seek him first, that you would be asking, God, I want, I want to redeem my life. I, I don't want to just exist. I want to live. And that life is found in putting God first and saying, God, what are you doing right now? See, God is building a kingdom. If you could imagine it, that it moves from, from, from before time, moves all the way up to today, all the way into eternity. He's building a kingdom, and, and it's almost just asking, so God, what do you want me to do that would be a part of that today? What, 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 would I, what am I supposed to be, what could I do? And, and maybe that's writing a letter or, or praying or communicating, but I'm just telling you, Jesus is inviting us out of a place of just existing, out of a place of worrying, into a place of seeking God first. And I just want to tell you, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. It certainly is the call that we would be there. That would be the high call that instead of just worrying about life, we would focus on God. Okay, one more. So Jesus has been chipping away. He's been chipping away at our worries. He's called us not to worry. And now the last verse, he speaks it this way. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own trouble. Sufficient for the day is his own trouble. I find this so fascinating. Jesus just calls us to be focused on living today, and I don't have time to unpack that. It's definitely been one of those themes that God has been working in my life, and I've shared it a few times with with you guys as a fellowship, that he's calling us to live today, that Paul would say in Philippians, you know, one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. I leave behind everything that's there, that James would tell us, hey, don't assume that you know where tomorrow is going to go. That's only arrogant. In fact, Jesus would simply tell us here, hey, tomorrow, let it worry about its own troubles. You be focused on living today, that we would be in a place where we would live today, that we would be fully present in this moment, that we'd say, God, I want to be fully here, that there would be a sense of saying, that's exactly what we want to walk in. I shared with our fellowship a a quote from Jim Elliott, just one of my favorites, where he simply said, wherever you are, be all there. Wherever, that, wherever life has found you, just be entirely present in that moment. That's the call. That's the call that would be there, and that's what Jesus is speaking about here. Verse 34, he says, you know, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. I like the message paraphrase in this. It's a paraphrase. It's not an accurate translation of the Greek or Greek language, but in some ways it tries to put it in a, in a paraphrase that would kind of say it. I, I really like the way it captures this verse. It says it this way. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Wow, I just love that. I just think it's, it's like, just give your entire attention to this moment. You know, tomorrow, God will be there with us tomorrow. And if there's hard things to deal with tomorrow, we can deal with them. He invites us to think this through, that we would be those who would walk in this, that we would be those who recognize that that's where we're supposed to go. Now, here's the quick thought. 
the scariest worries in our lives. They're all about tomorrow. Try this. Don't do it right now, but sometime today, pull up a news feed, however you read the news. And I want you just to think through what you're reading through. There are some things that deal with today that let us know, hey, this is a hard space today. There are some hard things that are happening. Those are real. That's we should walk in. But the scariest ones are all about what it might mean for tomorrow. The predictions, like, well, you know, what is this going to mean like? I mean, how many people are going to die? What, what's this going to look like for our economy? And where is this going to go in a month from now? And where is this going to be in six months? And I just want to tell you, nobody knows. Well, God knows. But none of us know. We didn't know a month ago we would be here. Nobody foresaw that you and I would be in this moment a month ago. Nobody. And so the idea is that when we spend our time worrying about what may or may not happen tomorrow, we're investing our life into entirely things that may or may never happen. That the goal of our place is to say, whatever I'm focused on is to say, okay, God, what are you doing right now? What do I need to do right now? Where does that, I mean, there might be things that roll into that and out of that, but it's all about focusing on now. Elizabeth Elliot said it well. She said, you know, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't change tomorrow at all. It doesn't make it any easy. It just robs us of power today. It robs us of living in that. And I'm telling you, Jesus just speaks this so practically. And for me, it's an amazing one. For a couple of you, this is the main one that you just recognize the things that you're really scared about right now, it's not really, you know, you're not really worried about surviving for the next 12 or 24 hours. You're worried about the future. You're worried about your retirement account. You're worried about what this looks like for, you know, six months from now. And you're, 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 you're obsessing about things that you have no idea what they're going to look like. And Jesus says, you know what, tomorrow we can deal with that tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough trouble. It's on. I'll, I'll be there with you tomorrow today. To to deal with worry is is to pull us back into this place where we would say, I'm going to live now. I'm going to focus now. Okay, well, let's sum up. We've walked through this this morning. We've talked about it, and I've been telling you, Jesus is telling us not to worry, and he's chipped away at it. He's told us things that we absolutely need to be thinking through, things that would rescue us from worry, where he tells us life is so much more than the things you worry about. That God knows you. He loves you as a heavenly father. He's told us that worrying is ineffective. That God is faithful, that you and I can trust him. Reminding us we have a heavenly father who who really does care about us. Calling us to seek him. Calling us to be those who aren't worrying about tomorrow. So I, I, I just wonder, is there one of these things that Jesus is saying that is more appropriate to your life now than any of the others where you'd say, okay, you know, I probably need all of them, but that one, (laughs) that's the one that's really not working for, I mean, if I could just incorporate that into my world, that might change everything. And to that end, I just want to tell you, as I told you at the beginning, what makes this list so powerful is everything that Jesus calls for, that that Jesus empowers, that there is that sense that God can do the impossible things in our life that he would be the power source that would carry us into the life that he has for us. And so maybe one of these things has been your focus, and I'm just inviting you to go to him and say, God, help me. Help me with this. Help me with this thing. Help me to become that one that would say, I'm going to trust you as a father, or I'm going to not worry about tomorrow, or I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Whatever those things are, they could become that place of rescuing. And maybe summing it all up in the most simple way, Jesus simply is telling us this is what he wants for us. That Jesus is saying, do not worry. I mean, that's that's what he's saying in this. He's given us reasons why we shouldn't. He's, He's helped us in that. But he's trying to rescue us from it right now. Where he's telling us, don't let that be your life. Don't be someone who's just living your life worried. I'd rescue you from that. And right now in this season of history, if we could do that, not only would it be life-giving to us, but we could be his light in the midst of a world. We could be his that would say, hey, look, and, and, and what, why, why do you guys are being able to handle this? We'd say, because we, we have something that we trust in. We have a God who's good and worthy, and we invite you even to know that. So close your Bibles, whatever it is you have open, and I just want to invite you into a space of prayer.
a place where whatever that is, whatever it is that God has spoken to you, he would just speak it in a fresh way into your life. One of the things that we do here on Sunday mornings, most of you who are usually present here, you know we give you this next moment to, to pray by yourself. That before you disengage, before you turn off the stream, before you, you move from this place, maybe there's one of those things we spoke of this morning. They're yours. We just want to invite you to pray about that. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to pray. Pastor Phil's going to lead us. He's just going to play some music in the background so we have a little bit uh, just happening there so you can be there. And I'm just going to invite you to take a moment and pray. I'll do the same. And then we'll come back together and close in prayer and worship in just a moment. Jesus, I thank you for your words, your call that we would not be a people that are given over to worry, your command that we would not worry, but also all the things you've spoken to us that would rescue us from that. God, those things which you've spoken to us, would you cause them, and and I just bring them before you and say, I love that you speak them, but very quickly admit, Lord, we'll never be able to live this life without you. And you know that. You told us that unless we abide in you, we could never live. We could never bear good fruit. Our connection is what's needed. And so, Lord, I'm asking, would you be the power of these things in our lives? Would you rescue us? Would you help us? Would you cause us to be a people that are not given over to worry? For some who struggle with that consistently, would you speak life into them and rescue that? For some that are struggling with it in ways they have not, maybe ever, or at least for a long time, would you bring life to them today? Would you cause us to be a people that know your joy, who walk in that, and are rescued? As we think about you just as our Heavenly Father, what a joy that is to come and just recognize, I have a Heavenly Father. I'm a a child of God. That changes everything. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for life in that. And I just bless you right now for your good work in us. We do that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. We're going to close in a worship song, but just want to bless you again and just long that God is meeting you. I just want to speak that blessing over your life that we do almost every Sunday. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.